Uh, thank you, and it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, Dr. Greg Meller. Uh, Dr. Meller is a consultant electrophysiologist from Papworth Hospital. He's also a St. George's alumnus and has published widely in the field of inherited arrhythmia syndromes. Uh, over to you, Greg, and thanks for joining. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, let me just share my slides. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yes, we can. And in full screen there. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, my name is Greg Mayer. I'm one of the EP consultants at uh, Papworth. And uh, thanks for the invitation to talk today about sudden unexplained death and the role of the molecular autopsy. So we know that sudden unexplained death in the overall population is common but mainly affecting older individuals and commonly due to the consequence of coronary artery disease, either in, in the setting of acute ischemia or ventricular arrhythmias as a long term consequence of previous infarction. But sudden unexplained death does occur in young adults. This is a summary of a series of epidemiological studies showing that the event rates of sudden unexplained death are in the vicinity of one in 50 to one in 30,000 patient years in those individuals aged at less than 35. The precise numbers vary depending on the, the definitions and the populations used, but it's around that, that figure of 1 in 50 to 1 in 30,000. The definition of sudden unexplained or sudden death is the death within one hour of the onset of symptoms when previously well, or the uh, death within 24 hours of last being seen well if the death is unwitnessed. And clearly one of the most important investigations in a sudden unexplained death is the post-mortem. Now I know Prof Shepard's coming up next to talk about the post-mortem, so I won't dwell on that, but this is a summary of historical post-mortem studies of sudden unexplained death. And the highlighted segments of each of these pie charts show how often the post-mortem is reported as being normal. So these are young individuals who have died suddenly and unexpectedly and at post-mortem examination have a structurally normal heart, both macroscopically and microscopically. And hopefully you can appreciate that this is a large proportion of patients, again, varying depending on the population looked at. It's been shown that in these sudden unexplained deaths with a, with a normal post-mortem, the so-called SADS deaths or sudden arrhythmic death syndrome deaths, that systematic screening of family members will identify evidence of an inherited condition in around a third of patients. These studies from the early part, uh, part of the century show um, that the, the, um, the yield and types of diagnoses made again varies depending on testing protocols, but in around 30% of patients or 30% of families rather, you'll find at least one affected individuals. And that shows us that a good proportion of these unexplained deaths are due to genetic cardiac disease. And that brought about the concept of a molecular autopsy. So molecular autopsy is post-mortem genetic testing in a case of sudden unexplained death, with the idea of providing a specific diagnosis for that patient and also potentially identifying other relatives at risk through the possibility of cascade genetic testing. Key to performing a molecular autopsy is the retention of DNA or tissue suitable for DNA extraction at the time of post-mortem. And as we'll come on to uh, shortly, that remains the biggest challenge uh, informing our colleagues in the coronial and pathology services of the need to store that DNA sample at the time of death. And obviously, once that opportunity is missed, none of what we're going to talk about now would be possible. This is reported as the, the first case of a molecular autopsy. It comes from the New England Journal of Medicine in 1999 from Mike Ackerman's lab in the Mayo Clinic. Um, and they reported a 19 year old lady who was found um, in cardiac arrest in a swimming pool after uh, going to the gym. She was resuscitated, but never regained consciousness and died on the intensive care unit two days later. There was a suggestion of long QT syndrome in the sense that she had a markedly prolonged QT while on the intensive care unit. And obviously the circumstances of death found be, being found dead having jumped into cold water is very suggestive of long QT syndrome. However, the molecular diagnosis arrived after her death when they did sequencing of the KCNQ1 gene uh, and found this three amino acid deletion 
um, causing loss of function and associated with long QT syndrome. You'll see again on the pedigree that her mother uh, was found to have a QT interval of 530 milliseconds and was then also found to carry the same genetic change. A number of studies uh, of molecular autopsy were performed in the early 2000s and they focused on a small number of genes, so KCNQ1, KCNH2 and SCN5A being the three genes responsible for long QT1, 2 and 3, SCN5A also being the major gene associated with Brugada syndrome, and finally RYR2 encoding the ryanodine receptor, um, which is associated with the CPVT. Most of these studies focused on young adults or children, uh, many of whom had died during exertion and reported yields of around 15%. As with many of our genetic testing uh, studies, this really, there was a big change when next generation sequencing became more widely available. Uh, and this landmark study from an Australian and New Zealand group was published in 2016. And this was a prospective study of a large number of consecutive sudden deaths across the country in individuals aged between 1 and 35 at the time of their death. And of those 480 patients, 113 who had a normal post-mortem and no diagnosis underwent genetic testing. A hierarchy of genetic testing uh, was used with an initial approach of that four gene kind of traditional molecular autopsy uh, with a yield of 9%. Those who, in whom that original test was negative went on to have ever expanding panels. So next, a 16 gene cardiac arrhythmia panel, and then looking at cardiomyopathy genes, both the major and then more loosely associated genes for cardiomyopathy. And finally, because of the link between sudden unexplained death and epilepsy, looking at a large panel of genes associated with epilepsy. And when you take into account all of those genetic testing panels, the overall yield of a positive genetic test was 27%, so extremely high for these cases, which would otherwise have been completely unexplained. Uh, St George's uh, was instrumental in a second similar study published in Jack in 2017. This was uh, 302 cases of SADS. So again, sudden unexplained death with normal post-mortem um, and this time with specialist cardiac post-mortem, many of which were performed by uh, Professor Shepard. And then genetic testing of a large panel of around 95 genes, inc including both cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia syndrome genes. You can find that the overall positive finding of pathogenic or likely pathogenic variance was 13%. The middle pie chart shows the spread of those genes, the main one being RYR2, as we said, associated with Z CPVT, but also a number of genes associated with the other inherited arrhythmia syndromes and a small number associated with cardiomyopathy. And these findings generally correlated and complemented the findings from clinical family screening uh, in these families. Uh, I've already mentioned before that the yield of these sorts of tests will vary depending on the population uh, examined and this is a good example again from the Mayo Clinic when you look at the effect of age and the mode of death or, or circumstances of death. So this is looking at the same panel of molecular autopsies with a significantly higher rate in younger children who die on exertion compared to those who are a bit older and it, Similar to the previous studies, RYR2 is the main gene implicated in this study. Um, molecular autopsy has been mentioned in guidelines uh, since around 2013, most recently in this very e excellent expert consensus document uh, released in 2020 and authored by Martin Stiles and Arthur Wilder, uh, along with many others. This is a, a, a screen grab from the section on sudden unexplained death and focusing on molecular autopsy. And their recommendation is that in case of sudden unexplained death where there is no identical phen phenotype, and in this chart they mention also after family screening, although in practice molecular autopsy is often taken uh, or takes part in parallel to family screening, that if you have a documented arrhythmic death with, with situations suggestive of an underlying arrhythmia syndrome, it's a class one indication to go on and do post-mortem genetic testing and a class 2A indication for anybody under 40 years old. They do not recommend 
um, hypothesis-free genetic testing in, in cases where there is no underlying suggestion of a cardiac arrhythmia. And importantly, in this paper, they suggest focusing on those genes associated with inherited arrhythmia syndromes, so the channelopathies. They do not recommend testing anything else. However, it's known and it's been recently shown explicitly that cardiomyopathy genes can be implicated in unexplained sudden death, both in those patients where they have died and have an autopsy negative sudden death or SADS, but also in sudden cardiac arrest survivors where clinical, clinical testing has not identified a cause. So this study looked at such patients who had already had an arrhythmia gene panel and then performed a large panel of uh, genetic testing for cardiomyopathy associated variants. And you can see that uh, a yield of just over 10% was identified in the autopsy negative sudden unexplained death group with the genes implicated on the right hand side. So most commonly truncating variants in Titan associated with cardiomyopathy, but also filamin C, BAG3, desmoplakin, and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genes, MYBPC3 and MYH7. And they compared these to control cohorts taken from the UK Biobank to show that these pathogenic variants were enriched in these populations and not just bystanders. How these cardiomyopathy genes go to cause sudden death without overt cardiomyopathy is still an area of intense debate and ongoing research, but it, I think it's well recognised that they do play a pathogenic role in these deaths. So what's the approach to genetic testing in the NHS? As you'll know, the genetic testing in the NHS now is centralised uh, with the National Genomic Test Directory laying out the criteria for genetic testing in a wide range of rare diseases. And this is the criteria used for the molecular autopsy. Uh, of note, also applicable to patients with unexplained cardiac arrest who survive. So genetic testing is eligible or is available for any sudden death with a normal postmortem in any individual below the age of 40. So reflecting that class 2A indication in the joint consensus document. But also in patients up to the age of 60, if there is an additional family history of unexplained sudden death in a young age or a, a further sudden death where the postmortem has also been normal. And that it's preferred that the postmortem should include assessment by experts, cardiac pathologists. Um, and again, Professor Shepard will, will explain the rationale and the benefit for this. In terms of which genes are selected, uh, this is again in, within the NHS now centralised through the panel app application, which I believe has been discussed at a previous study, uh, sorry, a previous talk. Um, but just to run over it very briefly, you start with a, a list of genes suggested by an expert panel, and then you have open crowdsourcing expert reviews to refine which genes should, should be tested for each indication, and this process is continually updated. The panel for molecular autopsy at present, uh, which has this name, number R138, includes eight separate gene panels for the conditions listed here. So for the five most common inherited arrhythmia syndromes associated with sudden unexplained death, that is Brugada, Long QT, CPVT, Short QT and progressive cardiac conduction disease, but also an out of step with that consensus document uh, include genes for hypertrophic, arrhythmogenic and dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is, I think, around 50 genes at, at present. We mentioned at the beginning of the talk that the most important part or sometimes the most challenging part is the logistics of this rather than the science. I think the science is now well established and our challenge now is to try and make this work in the real world. Um, this uh, list of objectives uh, is taken from a joint British Heart Foundation and NHS England pilot study to increase the, the rates of molecular autopsy across the UK. So essentially what this is looking to do is to improve communication between the coroner, the pathologist, the family, patients themselves, the ICC clinics and the GPs. And we're looking to create liaisons between those services to, within the coronial system, increase the awareness and the need for molecular autopsy, to streamline the pathways for transfer of and storage of genetic material to the uh, centralised laboratories and then passing on the results 
to the family and the ICC clinics to allow clinical and genetic cascade screening. It's in the early phases and there have been challenges, not least COVID, which, uh, which hit very soon after the initiation of this programme. Many of you may be aware uh, of this and some of you, you may be working at sites where uh, it's currently being rolled out. But the plan is that this will be NHS wide within the next few years. And so finally, I just wanted to uh, leave with uh, an intentionally unintelligible slide, which is the current layout for how this um, NHS wise sudden death programme might work. I think Professor Baer is going to touch on this later on, uh, and I leave this here simply to, to demonstrate how complicated the process is and how many challenges that we face. Thank you very much. And thank you, Greg, for a great talk. I very much enjoyed that. So, um, I have a question. So we've got a few minutes just before um, Professor Shepherd. Um, as a sure. clinician and broadly speaking, what's your approach for dealing with the variants of uncertain significance that may sometimes be thrown up by the molecular autopsy, particularly in the setting of a structurally normal heart? Yeah, so it's a great question, Chris, and something that's, that's clinically very relevant, not to just molecular autopsy, but all sorts of genetic testing. Um, I think the, the key as a cardiologist <clears throat> is to have very good links with your local genetic service um, and to have the opportunity to discuss each variant specifically. So we have a monthly MDT with our clinical genetics team and we go through these uh, variants of uncertain significance. And within that classification of VUS, you can have some that you're very suspicious of, particularly if they fit with the, the clinical phenotype or the clinical background. And there are others where you know, you, you're really not, not too keen. So the ones that are particularly suspicious, then you can look for um, either family se segregation. So you look for clinical evidence of the condition in relatives and then see if they carry the same variant and equally unaffected relatives not having the variants. That can sometimes improve your uh, your pathogenicity or if you've got access to a, a research lab who's able to do functional studies of the actual electrophysiological effects of the variant then that's extremely helpful as well of course that's not a, an easy process it takes a long time and requires a lot of funding but that's um, the other aspect that, that we look into uh, thank you i know they can sometimes be quite tricky especially when you're faced with the genetic results in the clinic um, but i think it underscores the importance of multidisciplinary uh, inputs, particularly with the clinical geneticists. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the final thing to say is that it's not a one-off assessment. You know, the, these interpretations of these results change over time. You know, things that we were calling VUSs five, six years ago will be much more confident now to, to assign as either benign or, or, or pathogenic. So, um, so I guess that's the other important thing to note, that the, the pathogenicity should be reassessed at, you know, periodically. Sure, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um,